Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, 1030 and um, uh, it is an absolutely gorgeous day here in Ithaca. It is, uh, I don't know, probably 50 degrees outside and blue skies and sunshine. So it's quite a delicious uh, experience for uh, for November in Ithaca. So it is my delight to um, introduce you uh, to uh, the uh, Northeastern Center at Northeastern IPM Center Research Update Conference. And um, and we are going to move along because we have kind of a, a swift moving schedule this morning, which hopefully is going to be a lot of fun for you. Um, so we are recording this and I'll send you a copy of the recording. Uh, probably uh, it may not be next week because it's Thanksgiving. So the week after it should be up and ready. And I will send you an email as soon as it's ready. We welcome your questions. If at all possible, please try and use the Q&A feature. Um, and um, I'm not sure that the presenters actually can use the Q&A, so you might need to use the chat, uh, but for everyone else, if it's possible to use the Q&A, that really helps me because then I can keep track of the questions um, and as long as everything else. And um, with that, we will actually begin. And our first presentation is with um, Byron E. Sands. Um, the title is A Systems Approach to Developing IPM for Cattle Producers in the Northeast, Social, Environmental and Economic Analyses. This was funded by the Northeastern IPM Center, and she is with the University of Vermont Extension. So welcome, Byronie. And I'm going to ask the other presenters to um, put your video off while um, Brian is uh, presenting. Hi, my name is Bryony Sands from the University of Vermont, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about our project looking at IPM um, on grazing cattle and optimising outcomes for cattle health, soil health and insect biodiversity. Um, so I'm going to dive straight into a dung pat here and just quickly tell you about all of the organisms that live inside. So obviously we have nuisance invertebrates like pest flies and parasitic nematodes, which you'll all be aware of. Um, but in the dung, we also have a whole host of beneficial invertebrates. Um, and these include insect decomposers. So they're breaking down the dung, recycling the nutrients back into the soil and getting rid of the dung quickly from the pasture surface. Um, and then we have predators, which will go around the dung um, eating other insects. So, for example, eating pest fly larvae, which is obviously very useful. Um, and finally, we have our ecosystem engineers um, and they are earthworms and dung beetles. Um, so control strategies for um, pests and parasites of grazing cattle um, have conventionally been um, sort of chemical parasiticides. Um, so these target the pests and parasites when they're in or on the cattle. Um, I have been interested in um, looking at breaking these transmission cycles out on the pasture. Um, by the um, ecosystem services provided by these beneficial insects which are processing the dung and removing it from the pasture surface um, and that's because these um, chemical pesticides have um, negative impacts on the environment in the pasture um, obviously there's uh, widespread resistance that's developing there's resistant populations of pest flies in new york state and um, across the us um, as well as internal parasite resistance um, and also um, organic producers um, can't use most of these chemical treatments so it's really important that we find um, alternative methods um, so last summer we wanted to know um, if um, IPM for cattle could control parasites effectively um, and at the same time support these beneficial pasture insects. So we worked with 29 grazing dairy farms in Vermont and New York um, that were using different grazing strategies and um, treatment methods, um, chemical pesticides and alternative uh, treatments. So we measured internal parasites in the cows using faecal egg counting. We measured pest fly abundances on pastures. Um, and we also measured beneficial insects, so dung beetles, flies, and parasitoid wasps. And then we did soil health testing on the pastures as well using the Cornell cash tests. So we found that rotational grazing strategies could effectively control internal parasites of cattle. 
Um, so you can see here that um, the pink bars are the farms that used chemical worming treatments and the blue bars are the farms that did not. Um, and for the continuously grazing, um, not using any chemical um, pesticide treatments uh, led to a higher risk of um, internal parasites. Whereas if you're rotational grazing, um, these strategies reduced the um, internal parasites without the need for chemical worming treatments. Um, looking at pest flies, uh, we can see the different treatment methods the farms used along the bottom and the um, chemical pesticides were by far the most effective, so that's cydectin and pyrethroids. Um, however, the fly predators, um, so the parasitoid wasps that some farms release, did seem to have some impact in reducing pest fly abundance. Um, then looking at dung beetle abundance, so these are uh, negative correlations between dung beetle abundance and pest fly and internal parasites abundance on pastures. So the dung beetles are competing um, with the pests and parasites for the dung or directly predating them um, and reducing their numbers naturally. Then we have um, the impacts of dung beetles on soil health in the pastures. So um, dung beetle species correlated with increased organic matter um, and decreased a bulk density, which is compaction. So obviously their tunneling action is bringing the nutrients into the soil and um, helping to reduce compaction. Um, we did the first dung beetle survey of, um, that's been done in Vermont and we found 18 different species um, and we made these really nice fact sheets. Um, so um, get in touch if you wanna know more about, about the dung beetle survey. Um, and finally, we did a cost benefit analysis um, and looking at economic and environmental costs as well. Um, and we found that compared to continuous grazing and treating the whole herd with uh, pesticides, um, rotational grazing and targeted selective treatments could reduce the costs by 4.2 to 6.7%. Um, so thank you for listening and that's it. Wonderful, thank you very much. It's a great way to start the day, huh? talking about cattle dung. <laughs> All right. Um, so our next presentation is by Alyssa Bullman, um, actually also on, um, on animals, Equine Pest Management Profile, a new guide for managing equine pests in the Northeast. And that was also funded by the Northeastern IPM Center. And um, Alyssa is at the University of Maine. Hey, I'm Alyssa Bullman, and I'm going to be talking about our recently developed equine pest management profile. So here in Maine, we have around 35,000 horses in the state. And um, these include working horses, racing, as well as pleasure horses. These animals generate about $500 million in sales and income here in the state. And they also use about 400,000 acres of land for pasture and hay. And this really keeps this land out of development and preserves it for future generations. So the Northeast did not have any kind of pest management plan for equines, even though we do have a number of pests that can cause some very serious illnesses, um, which impact the health of animals in the region. Um, and that includes those pictured here, including mosquitoes, ticks, and staple flies, which are all capable of transmitting diseases to um, equines. This was especially prevalent this summer as we had several cases of Eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile here in Maine. Um, and so we developed a pest management plan that focuses on equines um, in the Northeast. And you can find it by going to the IPM data center and clicking on crop profiles. So one of the big things our plan covers is how to identify different pests on equine facilities. So when we have been talking to farm owners and managers, we realize that a lot of people don't know that the flies they have on their farms are actually different species and that they require different management approaches. So for example, if we look at the four flies here in this picture, they all look very similar. Um, they're all black and gray and they're kind of about the same size and shape, especially if you're not looking at them really close up. But they can be identified based on where they're primarily found. So for example, face flies um, primarily feed on the secretions on the face, horn flies are biting animals on their backs, whereas stable flies are often found biting um, animals' legs. 
and house flies do not bite and they're usually found sort of in the long structures um, and, and sometimes they will be also found feeding on wounds that other insects have made. But all four of these flies require very different management strategies. So it's important to identify which pests that these owners are dealing with in order to properly manage them. So this plan incorporates the best integrated pest management control, control strategies we currently have for insects on equine farms. And these include physical control methods such as physical barriers like window screens, um, fly sheets, um, cultural methods that include managing discarded hay, drainage on a farm, and manure management, as well as different chemical and biological control strategies. So for example, this is the entry for biting midges that we created. Um, so first of all, we describe what they look like, and then we also describe what kind of impact they have on equines. And then we cover the different control strategies farmers can implement. So in this case, um, we don't have any commercial biological control agents available, and most chemical control also isn't very effective. But there are a large number of both physical and cultural control actions people can take to reduce biting midges on their farms. So we have a lot more veterinary entomology research going on in our lab right now as well. My research primarily focuses on staple flies, which are a really common blood feeding fly around horses and cattle. And the three areas I'm studying um, are looking at the population dynamics of staple flies. So to try to understand what factors are influencing their populations and when people should start managing them on their farms. Um, I'm also researching better biological control agents in the form of predatory mites to see if those can um, be used to manage staple flies on different farms. And then also trying to understand what role these staple flies may play in disease ecology. So are these staple flies feeding on wildlife and if so, could they potentially transmit wildlife diseases to our domestic animals? So if you'd like to read more about the Equine Pest Management Plan, you can look it up on the following website I have listed here. Um, and please feel free to contact me with any questions. I'd really love to hear from you. Thank you. So the next one that we have um, is, and I'm going to pronounce this name slowly, Arash Gal Egol Abhay. Bahani, um, and he is with the Rodale Institute, and um, this is a project that was funded by Northeast Sayre, and um, the title is Application of Ultraviolet Light and um, Mill Stop to Reduce Powdery Mildew Infestation in Organic green Greenhouses. Hello, everyone. My name is Arash Kalegola Bahani. I'm the Director of Research at Rodale Institute. And in the next five minutes, I'm going to talk about application of UV light and millostop to restrict powdery mildew infestation in organic vegetable greenhouses. Let me remind you before I start my presentation that we have three types of UV light, UVC light, UVB light, and UVA light. Among those, UVC light is the strongest one with germicidal effect. So in this particular research project, we used uh, or we assessed the effect of UVC light and UVB light on powdery mildew on lettuce plants. To start this project, we needed to detect the intensity of light that we can get from the source of uh, UVC lamp or light that we had in the lab. So we used a UVC detector, and uh, by that machine, we developed this model that you can see here. We realized that when we keep the plants at the distance of three inches from the source of light, the intensity of light that we receive is around 150 joule per meter square which is enough to restrict the powdery mildew spore germination. So that was the number that we were looking at, and we found that number in other literatures that other scientists published before. So 
for this uh, study, we exposed the seedlings to the UVC light and UVB light 24 hours before transplanting them into the main greenhouse area. Since we exposed the seedlings, not actual plants, we called that part of uh, uh, treatment as like prevention method. We wanted to make sure that we don't take the powdery mildew spores from the germination room to the main greenhouse area. Another layer of treatment that we added into uh, this trial was uh, application of Milostop, which is a commercial OMRI listed product that uh, growers can spray that in their organic agroecosystems to control fungal diseases. So to do the trial, we needed to make sure that uh, we have powdery mildew uh, on the plants that we are testing. So to do that, we made a methodology to infest the plants to make sure that we have powdery mildew on the seedlings. We developed that methodology and we sprayed powdery mildew on the plants. Then we exposed uh, infested plants to the UVC light for five seconds and to the UVB light for 10 minutes. Then we planted or transplanted the seedlings in, in a greenhouse, in 32 plots in a greenhouse, and some of the plots were sprayed by uh, Milostop also. So uh, let's look at the results that we collected. We realized that uh, we had 35% more yield in the plots that we had plants treated by Milostop and UVC light in comparison with uh, control units. That was great. It showed that our treatments worked. Other than the yield, we look at the infestation level. We had a methodology to assess the infestation level. I don't have time to talk about details of it. But we realized that in the control unit, we had three times more infestation in comparison to the beds that we treated the plants uh, in those beds with UVC light, UVB light, and Milostop. So when we combine the yield and infestation level, we realized that the place that we had our treatments, we produce higher yield and more marketable products, which both are great. So uh, I think I was on time. And thank you so much for your attention. And many thanks to our sponsors that you can see the list of them in this last slide. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you very much. All right. And our next presentation is by Michael Monson. It's surveying an insect collection from a 17th century northeastern agrarian settlement to determine changes in beneficial insects, pests, and climate. Um, it was funded by Northeast SAIR, and um, Michael is at Rutgers University. Hello, friends. My name is Mike. I am a graduate student at the Rutgers University Graduate Entomology Program in the lab of Dr. George Hamilton, and the project I'm presenting today is titled Surveying an Insect Collection from a 17th Century Northeastern Agrarian Settlement to Determine Changes in Beneficial Insects, Pests, and Climate. Insects can be very valuable information in archaeological investigations. Archaeoentomology can tell us about the season the site was deposited in, it can be used as proxies to study the site's climate, and sometimes what pests impacted the group of people being studied. The archaeological site we are using for this project is historic St. Mary City, which was the first permanent English colony in Maryland. The insect material comes from the coffin of the landowner, Philip Culver, who is believed to have died around 1680. We are using this site to study beneficial insects, 
pest pressure, and climate. Rove beetles are the beneficial insect we are focusing on, and we are using beneficial insects as a proxy to understand the system's ability to suppress pests. Finally, climate change, <clears throat> changes in climate will rely on drawing conclusions about the shared climate preferences of the insects in the archeological assemblage. And of course, the final goal of this is to translate these findings into applied strategies to benefit sustainable agriculture. These are the methods we are using, a one-year survey of the modern site insect fauna using pitfall traps and a de in deceased piglets in model coffins. We're also using morphological and ancient DNA to identify the archaeological specimens, and we are using uh, data models to try and model the site's environmental changes over the <clears throat> time period. We are now going to move on to some results. The first thing that jumps out to me about the archaeological assemblage is the huge number of predators and the relatively low number of flies. We do have the coffin fly Megacellius flaris, which does indicate a closed context and we will be using to discern seasonality. We have now completed the year-long survey, and on the left, you can see the number of beetles caught at the piglet coffin in September of 2022, and the rove beetle Creophilus maxillosis was frequently observed at the piglet coffin. So you can see an example of an adult Creophilus maxillosis also on the left. In our analysis, we are looking at, at the differences between pitfall traps on agricultural land versus heritage meadowland. And we are also sharing our current results with stakeholders to get their input on how best to apply our findings. In my opinion, the remains were likely in an advanced stage of decomposition when they were finally buried. And I also think we have collected enough data to make a meaningful use of species distribution models. And our focus for the near future is going to be continuing um, to complete our analysis and identify uh, all of our specimens. Before I end, first let me say thank you to my funders, including Northeast SARE, Fulbright Sweden, and NAFIA, to my all of my advisors on this project, and of course my collaborators and research assistants, Erin, Abby, Meads, and Sly, and thank you for all of your time today. And if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. Lovely. Thank you very much. I love that last slide. <laughs> so we have a couple of questions. Um, one is uh, from Alba Sol and said, could we please further discuss essential oils used in the cattle fly, fly control? Uh, that's for Bryony. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi. Yeah. So, um, so on that figure, um, it statistically showed no differences between the essential, the farms using essential oils and the farms not using any fly treatments. Um, we are hoping to sort of delve deeper into the, into these issues in future research because, um, so for this trial, we measured fly abundances on pastures by, um, emergence from cow patties. Essential oils are obviously used as a repellent, so they that wouldn't have captured any effect of like the flies being repelled from the actual cow. Um, so to test the essential oils properly um, in the future, we would like to do the fly counts on the actual cows because that would capture repellent effects as opposed to just the populations um, in the pasture. Great, lovely, thank you. And hopefully that answers uh, Alba's question. And uh, we have another question um, um, for Arash, and that is um, about the powdery, your powdery mildew study. Um, have you worked with curcubits at all, and why was la uh, lettuce chosen for the study? We, we selected the lettuce because... Hi, everyone. Sorry. So uh, we, we selected uh, lettuce because it's easier to work. That was the main reason. And uh, the problem in the greenhouse, that, that was a part, partnership grant that we got for this project. And uh, the problem that 
different grower had like uh, powder mildew, mildew in lettuce. So that was the reason we decided to do that. Uh, what was another part of the question? Sorry. Um, the first part was asking if you've worked with curcubits at all. Uh, no, we did not. Okay. All right. Great. That was that question. Um, and there are a couple of people who have their hands raised, and I cannot determine if that's because um, uh, because they have a question. But Nicholas, um, if you do have a question, if you could put it in the Q&A or in the chat, and I'll be happy to ask it at the next break. So we're going to move ahead. And our next presentation is by Veronica Yurchak. And um, the title of her presentation is Creating an Eco-Friendly uh, Pest Suppression Program in Sweet Corn. It was funded by Northeast Sayre and um, Veronica is with the University of Maryland. Hi everyone, I'm Veronica Yerchak. I am a postdoc in Saruti Hooks Lab at the University of Maryland. And today I'm just gonna be telling you a little bit about some of my dissertation research, creating an eco-friendly pest suppression program in sweet corn. So modern crop fields typically contain very little infield plant diversity, and this reduced diversity has reduced the availability of necessary resources for beneficial insects. These resources include things like nectar and pollen, alternative prey, habitable microclimates, and predator refuge areas. And together with other factors, this has contributed to major declines in insect biodiversity, including the biodiversity of pollinators and natural enemies. And so with that, one of the goals of this study was to try to use living mulches to increase the infield habitat complexity to attract insect natural enemies with the ultimate goal of reducing pest pressure and herbivore damage to sweet corn ears. And this study was set up as in a Latin square design with four treatments. So we had a conventionally tilled bare ground control treatment a no-till treatment, which was fall planted with a mixture of annual cover crops, which were rolled in the spring to create this surface residue that the sweet corn was planted into, and then two living mulch treatments. So the LMFR was fall planted with a alternating pattern of perennial red clover alternating with strips of forage radish. And forage radish was chosen because it's a winter kill cover crop. So it dies in the winter when temperatures fall below freezing. And that residue breaks down in early spring, which would give us a bare ground or relatively bare ground planting area between our strips of red clover without having to do any tillage. And then the other living mulch treatment, the LM rye, was again fall planted with red clover living mulch alternating with. Um, rye. And so this rye was rolled in the spring to terminate the rye and create that same surface residue as was present in the no-till. So to sample the insect natural enemy community, we used a number of different sampling methods. We used sticky cards, emergence cages, pitfall traps, and visual observations. Of course, there's not enough time to talk about the results of all of these sampling methods. So today I'm going to focus on the results of our sticky card trapping. So sticky cards were set at one vegetative and one reproductive corn stage around the V6 stage when the corn has six fully emerged leaves and then at silking. And overall, we didn't see any significant differences in natural enemy richness, diversity, or total abundance. But we did see consistent treatment differences for certain families of predators and parasitoids. And so one of these families was trichogrammatidae. This is a small egg parasitoid. And what we found was that across all three experiment years, we found significantly greater numbers of trichogrammatid wasps on sticky cards in the, both living mulch treatments compared to the conventional till and the no-till treatment. Similarly, we found significant numbers of big-eyed bugs in the living mulch, both living mulch treatments compared to the conventional till and no-till, again, in all three experiment years. Unfortunately, these specific differences were, did not result in enough of an increase in the natural enemy community to significantly reduce corn earworm damage. So corn earworm damage we found was similar between each treatment in 2020 and 2021, 
we unfortunately were not able to get yield data from 2019. Um, and in all, in both experiment years here, we also saw very low amounts of sap beetle and stink bug damage, but it did not differ between treatments. So overall, incorporating red clover living mulch into sweet corn production can increase the abundance of certain insect natural enemies, but not enough to reduce corn earworm damage to sweet corn ears. Even so, due to the high acreage of sweet corn that's grown in some areas, the adoption of these living mulch systems could potentially restore vital resources necessary for certain groups of beneficial insects on a large scale. And so with that, I just want to thank a whole host of people that helped throughout the various stages of this project and my funding sources, and I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, our next presentation is by Quan Zhang. It's entitled Using Yeast-Based Biocontrol to Manage Fire Blight Infections in the Northeast. It was funded by the Northeast IPM Center, and uh, Quan Zhang is with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Blossom Protect suppresses fire blight by inducing host immunity in apple by Quan Zhang from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Fire blight is a devastating disease of apple and pear, not only because it can cause significant yield reduction up to 40%, but more importantly, it can migrate into the trunk and root stocks and cause tree death. Blossom Protect is the, an existing biological control made by San Agro. It uses uh, yeast like fungi or Vasilium prurulens as its active ingredient. Blossom Protect has been demonstrated to be effective and has been widely adopted by many um, apple and pear growers uh, as a fire blight management option in the US as well as in Europe. In the US, it's mostly used by organic growers in the Pacific Northwest. Put its efficacy into the context of some of the existing material, we can see that the Blossom Protect provides about 60% of disease suppression efficacy that is comparable to the antibiotic control um, streptomycin. And it, it is also much higher than some of those bacteria and bacteriophage-based biocontrol um, agents existed in the market. Despite uh, its uh, superior performance in the field, how Blossom Protect achieves such high disease suppression efficacy that surpasses the existing biological control is unclear. Um, lack of information in that not only limit our implementation of Blossom Protect in the field, but also prevent us from developing similar biological controls for the future. In this study, we found that Blossom Protect induces the systemic acquired resistance in treated apple flowers. The red bars representing flowers treated by the Blossom Protect showed significant induction of the PR1 and PR2 two key genes for plant defense as compared to the blue bars, the non-treated flowers. Further, we found out that flowers treated by Blossom Protect uh, showed a fourfold increase in the plant uh, defense hormone salicylic acid levels as compared to the non-treated flower control. So what happened when flowers that were first treated with Blossom Protect and then encounter the fire blight pathogen Avenia mellivora. Compared to the non-treated flowers, flowers treated with Blossom Protect alone significantly induces the two immune in response genes, PR1 and PR2. Yet the flower infected with Avenia mellivora suppresses the expression of both genes. Flowers that were first treated with Blossom Protect and then inoculated with Avenia mellivora show the lower PR1, PR2 gene expression as compared to the Blossom Protect alone, but its expression is still much higher than non-treated and Avenia infected flowers. This suggests that the Blossom Protect primed host immune response, which could offset the immune suppression caused by the fire blight pathogen during flower invasion. This translates to a significant disease suppression from 
non-treated flowers that is about 90% infection to below 20% infection during Blossom Protect treatment. Blossom Protect is often applied between 70 to 90% bloom and it can be used with other materials with different modes of actions uh, as an integrated management program. These materials include copper, which is often used as a pre-bloom sanitation, um, plant growth regulators such as prohexidine calcium or apogee, ASM or ActiGuard um, to induce host immunity, intensify plant cell walls applied at pre-bloom, petal fall, and early shoot growth stages. Also, it can be used with uh, other non-antibiotic bactericides such as Provesto, Serenade, Quiva, or Oxidate during full bloom or petal fall stages. Field trials by uh, different researchers have demonstrated that using such um, integrated disease management program, people can successfully manage fire blight without antibiotic streptomycin. Thank you very much. All right, so we have one question for Veronica. Um, uh, someone said they think they missed the duration of the experiment. Do you think um, that you would have seen additional changes if treatments were continued for more years? Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, the, so the experiment went over three years. We repeated it three times. Um, I don't know that we would have seen any additional changes if we had continued the study for longer. But I do think that there was there's a, a good possibility that we might detect more differences if we used larger plot sizes. So our, our plots were 30 by 30 feet, and I think we had a lot of movement between treatments that made it difficult to detect differences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. So, All right. I think that's all the questions that I'm seeing. So if you do have questions as we go along, please feel free to put them in the Q&A, and I will ask at the Q&A breaks. Um, our next presentation um, is by Rosa Gutu, and um, the title is Optimizing Sustainable Integrated Pest Management Practices in High Tunnel Crops and Needs Assessment. It was funded by Northeast SARE, and Rose is with the Delaware State University. Hello, everyone. My topic is on optimizing sustainable integrated pest management practices in high tunnel crops and needs assessment. And it's purely So as a new SARE state coordinator, I needed to write a SARE professional grant to help guide this role. So for the first year, while I embarked on a needs assessment to help uh, guide my project, uh, SARE funded a project that was based on my participation in Delaware um, extension implementation projects over the years on pest management in high tunnels. So pest management has been a concern in high tunnels. During our small farms workshops, we focus on integrated pest management, which of course is pest prevention that focuses on ecosystem-based strategies for the control of pest-related issues. Now, in high tunnels, this is accomplished through a combination of techniques that include biological control, um, habitat manipulation, modification of uh, cultural practices, and also uh, use of resistant cultivars. And high tunnels, as we all know, are semi-enclosures, and the growers may actually use uh, chemicals that are recommended for the greenhouse. Now, the use of these chemicals is restricted to applications only after strict monitoring. So in the event that uh, the chemical agents had to be used or are required, they're supposed to be applied on a at, you know, in a targeted manner um, so that we can minimize risks on the environment, on the organism, and also risks to human health. The resources that we use in our extension efforts are not limited to the, those that are mentioned on this um, slide. Um, SEA itself has funded a plethora of high tunnel research uh, that's related to pest management. And some of the presentations that have gone forth from 
even this forum give great information for us specialists to pass over to growers or even to ag agents. So uh, for high tunnels and IPM, the information on biocontrols, information on trap crops, on best varieties to grow, varieties that are adapted to high tunnels, controlling moisture and humidity, and just some of the common pests and upcoming ones is normally very important. So we pass our information through workshops and other extension events. Um, for example, we just had a Black Farmers Conference. So we also carry out farm visits uh, to our Delaware high tunnel farmers which is normally very impactful. Some of the farmers actually work with us to even you know, help collect some data from, from their, their farms or from their, their high tunnels. Our messages are very simple and pointed and normally timely too. And for high tunnel growers, uh, one of the things that we really hit upon is the proper uh, placement of the structure. And this normally helps to optimize growing conditions, which goes a long way in helping with, you know, IPM. Uh, we pass information on best management practices as would be required in high tunnels. And most of this is research-based information. We invite specialists who, you know, come and talk to in our workshop to do this. We also try to include this in our uh, articles like for this time we actually had two articles in about IPM. And the needs assessment involved administering surveys to ag agents and this helped me come up with um, a topic or a project that um, I will be tackling for the next two years for the period of the, the grant as a state coordinator. Thank you all, and I hope to get any questions um, during the panel session. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And um, our, we have one more in this uh, segment from Alejandro Calixto, um, Integrated Pets Management Program for New York State. Um, it's an EIP project that was funded from uh, 2021 until 2024. And um, Alejandro is with the uh, New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. I'm Alejandro Calixto. I am the director of the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. And I'm gonna be talking about the extension implementation plan, uh, a grant that we received uh, from uh, US DFA that runs from 2021 uh, up to uh, 2024. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, restoring ecological resilience, uh, part of the conservation of control efforts, uh, supporting New Year's uh, urban farms. And uh, we have uh, produced uh, guides uh, both in English and Spanish about beneficial insects, uh, but also we have established uh, demonstration plots across the state to educate uh, communities about the benefits of attracting uh, beneficial arthropods. The other one is invasive species, of course, put an fly moving really quickly into, into the Northeast, uh, uh, getting a lot of press, uh, particularly in New York, uh, also helping uh, with early detection, biology and management. Uh, you can see our uh, student, Crystal Dixon, who uh, was the first person to detect uh, spotted fly in vineyards in New York State uh, last year. Uh, but also uh, getting a lot of attention in our social media and in our website. Uh, we're proud to say that we have uh, received uh, five times new users uh, compared to the College of Agriculture uh, in Cornell University. And also just just getting into uh, different uh, media uh, media venues and uh, 
uh, one of the most uh, fun and interesting one uh, was uh, uh, this kid in Saturday Night Live on SLF uh, where we are the experts. So feel free to watch this. Uh, there's a QR code where you can go on YouTube and watch it for free. <laughs> this summer, an invasive species, the spotted lantern fly, has spread throughout the Northeast, destroying local vegetation. Experts are so concerned, they are encouraging people to kill them on site. And if you've seen one, you might agree. Let's take a look. I'm a spotted lantern fly. I don't care what experts say. I'm going to eat your craw. Something that has got a lot of attention and it has really helped us to uh, uh, deliver the message about uh, invasive uh, species uh, and prevention. Uh, also on our digital IPM system, so we have one of the most uh, robust uh, decision support systems where we have up to 32 species of insects and pathogens. And we have added two new ones, the spotted lanternfly. We have a beta version uh, of uh, that decision support system. It's a, it's a forecast system and a secret maggot as well. Also, the environmental impact quotient, which is a risk assessment tool that allows you to select pesticides based on uh, their environmental uh, and uh, human risk uh, profile. Uh, it is a platform that is being now adopted uh, by different companies and uh, that is uh, currently under uh, review. Of course, uh, a pest of public health importance is, is something that is, is, is really critical in the Northeast with tick numbers uh, increasing. We're uh, heavily engaged uh, in tick research and, and outreach. We have uh, a massive campaign that is called Don't Get Tick New York uh, and uh, that we're even expanding into Spanish speaking communities and also doing a lot of surveillance uh, of different uh, tick species. Uh, also here, uh, uh, just uh, kind of an overlap of uh, kind of a community problem moving into agricultural systems, uh, uh, rodents uh, in the storage seed facilities uh, becoming an increasing problem, uh, particularly uh, posing a risk uh, for uh, farm employees. So we've been working really hard into uh, doing outreach and education uh, in these, uh, under these setups. Uh, and also, we just want to bring uh, IPM to everyone. So uh, we've been developing different uh, tools and platforms, uh, working uh, with the Pesticide Safety Program, which is now part of the IPM program, uh, de delivering, uh, developing and delivering uh, materials and educational programs, uh, both in English and Spanish, uh, to target uh, diverse audiences in the state. For more information, uh, here's our QR code uh, where you can uh, visit our new uh, and rebranded website uh, where you can find more information about our projects and those that are being uh, funded through the EIP, uh, the Extension uh, Implementation Program uh, funded through uh, USDA NIFA. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So it's not often you get to see Saturday Night Live on, on an IPM research update uh, conference. Um, so I am not seeing any questions that have come in um, about uh, the last uh, few. Um, uh, oh, actually, somebody has asked, and I'm not sure uh, that uh, Alejandro is here. Um, I know he said he had a very tight schedule today. Oh, he is. Okay. So someone said, how did you get on S SLN and what was what was that process? Oh, you have to uh, pay. Uh, the YouTube uh, premium option allows you to download the videos. So okay. we, we have the actual video. So you, you have to pay for it. But uh, uh -huh. So, but as far as uh, I think the question was, how did, how did that, how did you get that made in the first place like the connection with sln how did oh, that come about sorry yeah uh, that was uh yeah just people reaching out to our specialist brian Eschenauer, who uh you know he's our invasive species specialist he's been on the front of this uh issue in the state so a uh, lots of visibility and uh they, they reach out and, and got some questions about this kid so uh yeah that, that's been a, a something that has gotten a lot of visibility for the program uh, in your state so for sure that's great <laughs> well, i think that's the first man and uh, hopefully not the last but uh anyway great so wonderful um in that case i think uh we are going to move on thank you alejandro i appreciate it i know you've got a busy day and um so our next presentation 
with, we'll move along uh, to um, is uh, Philip Fanning uh, from the University of Maine. Uh, his presentation is on classical biological control for spotted wing drosophila in the northeastern United States. Hello all. So my name is Philip Fanning. I'm an assistant professor of agricultural entomology here at the University of Maine. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you about progress towards classical biological control uh, for spotted wing drosophila in the northeastern United States. Um, Spotted wing drosophila is an invasive vinegar fly that was first discovered in California in 2008. It is native to Southeast Asia. We call it spotted wing drosophila because the males have those dark spots in their wings, um, as you can see in the right hand side here. And this is a significant pest of berry crops here in the United States and globally. Ever since we found spotted wing drosophila in 2008, a key goal of the research uh, has been to develop classical biological control options uh, for the control of spotted wing drosophila. Foreign explorations for parasitoids began pretty fast, and so far 19 species of parasitoid have been found attacking spotted wing drosophila in China and Korea, where ex explorations were um, ongoing. Tree species, uh, which accounted for about 85% of the parasitism of spotted wing drosophila in its native range, uh, were imported back here to the United States into quarantine uh, and studied for basically release as classical biocontrol agents. After all of those um, studies, um, a federal release permit was issued for Gnaspis brasiliensis, uh, which is the species here on the left-hand side, um, and Leptophilina and Asabara uh, were not host-specific enough, um, so no release permit was issued for them. Following the federal release permit, um, our cells here in Maine and our collaborators in Cornell and Rutgers um, received colonies of parasitoids um, from the USDA in Delaware, and we established our colonies in the spring of 2022. We began releases in June and July of 2022 at 13 sites. Um, releasing over 11,000 Gnaspis brasiliensis. We then monitored intensely at those sites after releases to track basically the establishment of Gnaspis brasiliensis. However, to our surprise, um, we detected primarily Leptopolina japonica, uh, which was not issued a release permit um, in that sampling. We have continued to release Gnaspis brasiliensis in 20. 23, uh, working at a total of 19 sites and releasing over 13,900 Gnaspis brasiliensis. Now, our discovery of Leptopolina japonica has been reflected in other states. You can see here this map uh, provided by the USDA. Leptopolina uh, is an advent establishment, so it established by itself without releases, probably being imported in, in contaminated fruit material and it is established significantly here on the Eastern seaboard. Looking at some data here from Maine specifically, as you can see, we have released at four sites in 2022 and five sites in 2023. Um, we first discovered our leptopolina in 2022 when we had 93 total leptopolina returned primarily from one site, which is site two, in site in 2023, we had the same site, site two. We returned over 852 Leptopolina japonica. We also did recover Gnaspis brasiliensis. But if we look at our percentage parasitism associated with our parasitides at our, all of our sites collectively across um, our year here in 2023, you can see Leptopolina, which is in gray really dominated our collections. Um, we also see really good parasitism rates. Uh, we have parasitism rates as high as 60 to 65%. Um, so both Leptopolina uh, and Gnaspis brasiliensis are establishing and they're being effective. So just some conclusions and future plans. So Gnaspis brasiliensis releases are ongoing here in the Northeast. Uh, however, in Maine especially, 
uh, Leptoplina japonica appears uh, to be well established and contributing to high rates of parasitism. Uh, we're going to continue uh, releasing them at untreated and minimally managed sites. Uh, we will continue into summer of 2024. Uh, finally, we're looking at the methods that we use to monitor them. Uh, we've noticed that fruit collections are the best method. Um, and finally, we're also working on looking at its overwintering success and how it interacts with insecticides and reduce risk management options. And thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much. So our next uh, presentation is by Simon Zabilo. It's entitled Empowering Small-Scale Limited Resource and Other Farmers with IPM Knowledge. It was funded through EIP, and um, Simon is with the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Hello, uh, this is Simon Zivero from the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. I am here to present um, our EIP project entitled Empowering Small Scale and Limited Resource and Other Farmers with IPM Knowledge. So this project is in collaboration with University of Maryland Extension, University of Maryland College Park, and also University of Maryland Eastern Shore Extension. So we do have um, researchers who are plant pathologists, entomologists, extension specialists, animal scientists who are involved in this uh, project. As you can see here, their names are listed here. So UMS has small farm program. I just want to relate this EIP project really closely with this small farm project because the main mission of this small farm project uh, program is to deliver educational program training and outreach that helps uh, small scale farmers. So the most end users are in Maryland, this small farm uh, program extends its support throughout the Delmarva region. It is not only constrained to small farmers, also uh, different farmers uh, who have large scale farm involved in this program too. Maryland is an agriculturally diverse state interfacing ecologically sensitive and economically vital Chesapeake. So Chesapeake Bay is second most important economic resources in Maryland. This situation makes it creating eco-friendly IPM program in Maryland is essential. So UMA's IPM program is tasked with providing farmers information that allows them to farm sustainably. So the main objectives of this EIP project are maintaining the economic viability of small scale uh, limited resources farmers and providing these farmers information that allows them to uh, farm sustainably by conserving environmental quality and natural resources and educating them with pesticide uh, users about safe use of and handling of pesticide products and effective use of biological control agents. So this EIP project has 50% that includes IPM implementation specialty crops focusing on cucurbits, sweet corn, eggplants, strawberries, and grapes. And 23% of the EIP project is IPM impl impl implementation in agronomic crops focusing in hemp and soybean. And also it has 70% focus on IPM implementation in animal agriculture, which is with focus ma mainly with poultry production. So, so far, uh, we did a lot of activity. The main thing what we did is we uh, launched UMS IPM websites and it has a lot of information that we can share with our growers and also we had uh, actually two conferences which is extension lunch and learn presentation on fly management in poultry facility and residence and which is where I attended and in springs and also we had a couple of um, 
uh, on farm uh, demonstration and also different presentations at different events including the ag discovery with uh, farmers and students included on this ag discovery program and also we did a lot of presentations including on uh, the central maryland vegetable growers meeting and also we participate on uh, noxious wheat low and dry of way of management which is uh, mainly provided to uh, pesticide applicator uh, trainees and uh, in we had several presentations in the UMAS small farm conference mainly with integrated pest management uh, uh, in vegetables and field crops and also we had uh, uh, actually on farm a demonstration the use of sweet corn as trap crop in uh, hemp fields just want to acknowledge uh, the funding from USDA NIFA Thank you for your attention and if you have any question please feel free to send me an email and also i don't mind sharing the detailed report thank you very much lovely thank you very much and we have a couple of questions for um philip fanning um to a few questions um so the first is, are you finding the highest uh, parasitism rates in the fall and in which crops? And I assume raspberries and that question was from Jaime Pinero. Hey, Jamie. Yeah, uh, our highest rates were in the fall. So we found those 60 to 65 percent parasitism rates in wild raspberries and blackberries, um, mostly in September. Um, and we really only see our parasitism starting off in kind of like mid-August. So it takes a while for them to catch up with the spotted wing drosophila populations, um, but they do kind of grow pretty fast and get some good parasitism after that. Okay. Um, I see David has a question as well. Uh, will the parasitoids for SWD parasitoid other flies? So for Ganaspis brasiliensis, no. There was a lot of research obviously done before we could get a release permit for the federal government, and they are very host specific. Um, but I guess for Leptopolina, there is definitely a bit of a wider host range associated with that. And that's why it was denied a release permit. Um, but unfortunately, well, it, it found its way here to the Northeast in the United States um, without even us, um, you know, doing any releases. Um, so that will definitely probably target some non-target uh, Drosophilids, um, which, which is obviously unfortunate. Um, the two species though work really well together. Um, a lot of the, a lot of a lot of the research on, we'll say, the host parasitism was done in the lab, and we haven't quantified it in the field. So, we are very interested to find out whether Leptopolina in the field, whether it will attack those species in, that we saw in the lab when we really forced them to attack those species, or if it's just going to really just go after Spotwing Drosophila. So now that it's here, there's, there's some research we need to do to kind of figure out. What its risk will be to other drosophilids, but it's certainly going after spotting drosophila really well and, and providing some good biocontrol, and we'll say for that species. Uh, I see Alyssa has a question. Question for Phil Fanner regarding spotting drosophila Has any research been conducted on the interactions between the two parasitoids? Um, so, in its native range, when we were like doing foreign explorations, they actually work really well together. Um, so they usually spot wing drosophila or Ganaspis is a very picky parasitoid. It'll only parasitize uh, larvae that haven't been parasitized before. Leptopolina are a bit more broader. They'll, they'll parasitize any kind of larvae, even if they've been parasitized before. Uh, so in the field, we saw nearly a synergism, the field uh, research in China and Korea when they were collecting them, they nearly synergized. So they're going to work really well together. The Asabara species that I mentioned in the talk, that would compete with the other two, which would be a bit of an issue. So we hope, hopefully that won't, won't get introduced here as well. Great. All right. I think that answered all of the questions. Um, 
And there is one question. Thank you, uh, Philip. And uh, there's one question for Simon uh, from Deb Grantham. She said, I may have missed this, but how many farmers are you targeting and how many are participating and are you seeing changes in their participation? And hopefully Simon is here with us. I know he emailed me this morning, so let me just check if he's here. Uh, actually, it looks like he is not here at the moment. Um, I know people had changes in schedule since they signed up, but we'll, uh, so we'll move on. And uh, we have two more presentations. They're both uh, from uh, uh, the team at the New York State uh, Integrated Pest Management Program. The first is by Betsy Lamb, and it's on Greenhouse IPM Scout School, online and hands-on training for current and next generation scouts. And this was funded by Northeast Sayer. Good afternoon. This afternoon, I would like to talk about the Greenhouse IPM Scout School project that we ran. Uh, the first grant we had was to write the curriculum. The current grant is to run an online and hands-on training for current and next generation scouts. And um, the team that I'm working with, uh, Marjorie Daughtry and John Sanderson are at Cornell. Mary McCuller was our active learning specialist and she's also at Cornell in the vet school now. Elise Lobdell is a greenhouse scout, commercial greenhouse scout in New York. Stephanie Burnett is at the University of Maine and Cheryl Sullivan is at the University of Vermont. So this group mostly works in, in greenhouse floriculture, um, but we also recognize that the project that we're looking at would work for greenhouse fruit and vegetable crops, cannabis, and even uh, field crops and any other place you might need scouting. There are currently very few commercial scouts for greenhouse operations in the state and in the region. Uh, and in addition to um, looking at commercial scouts, the greenhouse employees that sometimes are doing scouting already or might not be can also use training. And we were also interested in learning how to have students, either grad, grad students or college students, we actually had a high school student also do this in the first run, get some hands-on training in scouting to help them get jobs in greenhouse in the greenhouse industry. And, and then looking across all of these populations was how to get reach the most people, but still have hands-on training when we were trying to avoid having to have everyone travel for the for the training um, and possibly even do things in an asynchronous manner. So we decided to try an online certification program with remote hands-on activities. So in order to do that, we required that all students that were applying for the certificate had to find a greenhouse or someplace to scout. And they did an amazing job at finding something to scout. In January and February, in some parts of the region, there aren't very many greenhouses that were open. So we had people scouting in schools. We had people scouting in university greenhouses. We had people scouting their house plants. And the project worked regardless of what you were scouting. So there were six weeks of an hour and a half per week of online training. And that was all recorded so that if you weren't, if you couldn't take it uh, live, you could watch it later. And it's available to students more or less forever as until we <laughs> change it, I guess, and um, or the Moodle platform takes it down. We sent each certificate student a package of equipment, including magnification equipment with things like hand a hand lens and a handheld microscope shown here, as well as an optivizer. We'll see a picture of that later. Sticky cards, flagging tapes, the things that you would need if you were scouting in a greenhouse was based on the Moodle teaching platform. Um, it had student discussions and Q&A forums, so you could post questions and pictures with your questions, and anyone could respond, both the instructors, but also other students, that all the assignments were posted and turned in on Moodle, again, with photographs uh, to support the, the questions that were asked or the assignments that were, were created. And there were quizzes, which we didn't require, but we found that people liked, so we actually improved those for the latter the second time we ran it. it. This program is also available as a one hour webinar uh, each week um, for anyone that was interested. So you didn't have to be a certificate student. You could take those if, if you anyone could take them. Um, you could take one or all six if you were just taking the webinars. In both cases, they did cost money, but it certainly cost more to do the certification program. Uh, there were DEC pesticide recertification credits available to anyone who, who took the program and wanted them. 
So this is an example of a question that was sent into the forum. And so although it has to do with grapes, the diseases are still the same diseases that we've been talking about. And so um, they posted the question in pictures and Marjorie Daughtry responded. She's a plant pathologist. And here's an example of an assignment where we asked about uh, you know, people to look at the sticky cards to see what was going on. Also what their extension office was to post that. Um, and then it, to check for weeds in the greenhouse that they were scouting and, and send us pictures of what they found. So in terms of how many students we had, we've run it twice just to check the difference between the January, February timing and the September, October timing. Um, we found that January and February is definitely the better timing. It is considered the education season for greenhouse operations. We had 28 certificate students and we figured we maxed out, we would have maxed out at 30. Um, there are 54 webinar attendees who attended one or more of the webinars. In September and October, we had only eight certificate students and 24 webinar attendees. And that's kind of what convinced us that the January, February, or sometime in that uh, early spring time is a better time to run this program. So what was the coolest thing as far as we were concerned is that it actually worked. Um, so the students said 96, for the students, 96% were recommended to someone or take it again. From our point of view, it worked because students did the assignments, they posted questions and pictures. Most importantly, they interacted with us and with each other and, and worked their way through all the different pieces that we were asking them to do. Um, 30 of the 36 students who completed the, did actually complete the requirements for the certificate. And we did evaluate the webinar uh, attendees also, who also uh, found it worthwhile, but in this case, we're working, looking more at the certificate students. Thank you, any questions? Great. Thank you very much. All right. And so this is our last presentation. Uh, it's by Matt Fry, um, also with the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, and it's on Municipal Rodent IPM Working Group. Hello, my name is Dr. Matt Fry, and I'm an extension educator with the New York State IPM Program at Cornell University. Today, I'll be giving an update on a working group partnership grant, the Municipal Rodent IPM Working Group which was co-organized by Ray Delaney from the City of Philadelphia Department of Public Health, Dr. Bobby Corrigan of Corrigan Consulting, and Dr. Jody Gangloff Kaufman from the New York State IPM program. There's no question that rats are a common yet despised part of urban living. They carry pathogens, contaminate and consume food, cause structural damage, and necessitate management that can represent an economic burden. The Northeastern United States is host to several large cities, each with their own rat mitigation program that varies in terms of its size, scope, and funding. Interestingly, despite their shared goals and challenges, these municipal rat management programs work in isolation with no formal coalition or even a method of communication. This prompted co-PI Ray Delaney to propose the formation of a working group to open communication between the cities and create a network of individuals involved in urban rat management. The working group was funded from April 2021 to March 2023 and included several objectives and deliverables. First, we strove to as assemble a diverse group of stakeholders involved in municipal rat management. We invited over 50 people to participate, representing municipalities, academicians, and the pest management industry both technical representatives and practitioners. All invited members were eager to participate and new members are added as they request to join. Currently, there are 88 people on the listserv representing three countries, 19 US states and Washington DC. Participants come from 58 organizations, including 22 municipalities, 17 industry partners, 18 academics and one US federal government employee. Virtual meetings were held to bring members together, and our first meeting included presentations from six municipalities about their rat management programs. Our second meeting was discussion-based, including conversations about definitions and measures of success in municipal rat management and the challenges and opportunities for this field. A third meeting was set up in response to current events and included a discussion on how municipalities should respond to cases of rodent-borne pathogens. Meeting notes for all sessions and a recording of the third meeting are posted on the working group's website 
created by the team at the Northeastern IPM Center. Overall, attendees valued their participation in meetings and enjoyed learning about different rodent management techniques used by municipalities. Plus, having a forum to discuss opportunities in municipal rat management with colleagues. To help advance the science of municipal rat management, we proposed to identify the three to five most important research needs. Topics were collected from all meetings and specifically solicited during the second meeting. A ranking tool was sent to all group members, allowing them to prioritize the research needs most important to them, and this was formalized into a research priorities document posted on the website. Additional outputs of the funding included a white paper that summarized current approaches to municipal rodent management. Because this information is not currently available in the primary literature, we are preparing the document as a manuscript for publication. A roadmap to, for municipal rodent management was developed to chart a course for the advancement of this field. Several recent publications note that the long-standing war on rats approach taken by cities has failed to produce long-term rat reduction. Therefore, the roadmap identifies key objectives and approaches for success. Finally, the pest management industry plays a role in municipal rodent management as many companies either collaborate directly with cities or contribute to the overall management of the rat population. Our article in Pest Control Technology Magazine identifies key lessons learned from municipal programs that are relevant to industry professionals and is set for publication in November 2023 issue. During the funding period, additional activities were undertaken, including delivery of presentations about municipal rat management, responding to media inquiries, and correspondence via the listserv. Looking to the future, we hope to hold an in-person meeting in 2024 and host more regular conversations. Great. Well, that is our last presentation, and I'm struck that we start, started with cattle dung and end with rats. So <laughs> we have an interesting beginning and end. Um, I do not see any more questions, but if you have them, pop them in, and, uh, and I will go ahead and uh, ask that. And uh, but for now, I want to share with you that um, we have something called Find a Colleague. Um, so uh, it, you can post a profile of yourself at the link here. And also um, we have a, a site on our website where you can go and see uh, profiles of other people. So, for example, if you wanted to connect with Matt Fry about the rodent working group, um, uh, actually, you could go to a link on our website because uh, the, uh, the working groups are hosted there. But if you wanted to uh, connect with him or any of the other presenters, um, you could go check out and see if they have a profile on the Find a Colleague site. More and more people are doing that. So it's a great way to get in touch with uh, people that you may not have interacted with before. You can do keyword searches. And uh, so I wanted to share that with you. And uh, we do have a quick poll for you so we can uh, gauge um, the quality of the research update conference for you. So it should pop up on your screen any moment now, as if by magic. There it is. Okay. And I believe that if you are um, a panelist, you may not see the polling questions. So um, there are just four simple questions and I'll be quiet for a few minutes while people have a chance to address that. All right. Thank you very much. Um, all right. And um, so just a reminder that we are recording this and uh, we will uh, post um, an edited version uh, possibly next week, but because of the holiday, maybe the week after. And I will also email um, all registrants a copy of where to find that uh, link. And we'll see if we can get um uh, a better version of Elisa's um, recording for you so that it's uh, so that it's easier to, for everyone to watch. Um, and we have one question actually that has come in for Matt Fry, um, who I know you are here online. Um, and that is, uh, let me see, um, what are your hopes for the future of the Municipal Road and IPM Working Group? Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for the question. So we we are hoping to have more regular meetings with this group. There's a lot of um, 
practices that are done by municipalities that are not based on science. And what we're hoping is that in the future, we could kind of work together across municipalities to test different approaches that are being used, and then maybe formalize those into best management practices. Our white paper that we're hoping to publish kind of talks about what's being done right now, um, but it doesn't really evaluate those scientifically. So that's, that's one hope. Um, we're also hoping to have regular annual meetings in person. So that's um, that would be one outcome uh, in the future that we hope to fulfill. Um, the working group is not currently funded, so this is all being done kind of on our own time. So we, we do hope to sustain the effort and um, move forward with advancing the science of the field. Yeah, great. Yeah, and I know a lot of um, the working group groups do continue sometimes for years and years uh, after their first formation. So. Um, and I see that, thank you. And um, I see that Kevin has posted the link to uh, where you can uh, put a profile and um, and uh, free of the find a colleague uh, link. And um, so with that, I would like to say thank you very, very much to um, our funders, USDA NIFR. Um, without their funding, we wouldn't be able to put this together and share all the wonderful resources and, and and research that people are doing across the region. And um, I hope this has been fun for you. It's had always fun and interesting for me uh, to see the different topics that uh, people are, are researching around the area. So with that, I will uh, say thank you very much and uh, declare this uh, complete. And uh, for those of you that are in upstate New York or have equally beautiful weather, I hope you have a wonderful lunchtime and you get to spend some time outside in the sun. So. Okay, bye-bye.